Welcome to this video on Inventor Nastran and thermal stress. There are two different approaches that can be utilized in Nastran. The first approach that we're going to do here is whenever your part or your assembly, those components are all at the same elevated temperature or same reduced temperature from what the stress-free reference temperature is. Uh, when you do that, you can do it all within one shot within a linear static analysis. And then the alternate approach is utilized whenever you have a, a temperature distribution. And uh, that is some gradient across the part or across the assembly. And we'll cover that in a separate video. But for this one, we're going to assume that the entire part is going to be put into an oven, for example, uh, and raised to some temperature, or it could be put in a freezer or taken to some extreme uh, outside temperature where uh, the part or assembly is subjected to a, a lower temperature. And again, in that case, this can all be done uh, within a single linear static stress analysis. So the part that we're looking at is just some geometry that I made up on the fly, just something that was a little more interesting than maybe a rectangular bar or cylindrical bar. So it was basically an L-shaped bracket, uh, and then I added a cylindrical extrusion here and, the, and a rib to it. Um, before we get into the Nastran portion of it, uh, I am sitting inside the Autodesk Inventor program. I'm using 2022 here. Let's take a quick measure, uh, because we can do a little bit of validation here. Uh, just to check some of our results. So I'm going to find out what the height of this is across the back. So it's five inches tall, uh, and we'll use that to confirm our, our results uh, once we get to, to that point of the analysis. So let's go ahead and go into the Environments, and off the Environments tab, I can select Autodesk Inventor Nastran. And again, what we're going to do is set this all up within a linear static analysis and um, I'm going to go ahead and change the material so underneath the solids it has some generic material assigned to it and we know that I can double click and, and bring up the screen here where I can just type in my values if I wanted to or if I go to select material then I can pull from, from several different libraries the Autodesk material library the inventor material library or if I click load database I can get into Nastran's own library I'm just going to go ahead and select something from the Autodesk Material Library, and I'll scroll down until I see the steel ASTM, and I'm going to choose the A36 material. So uh, taking a look, we can see that we have density defined. We have our modulus of elasticity, which we'll need, uh, Poissons, and of course, uh, since this is a thermal stress analysis, we do want to have a thermal coefficient of expansion. Uh, this T-REF is one of the ways that we can define our stress-free reference temperature, and we will do that a little bit later on in the video. I'm going to show you an alternate method to begin with. So let's go ahead and just say, okay, we'll leave that at, at, a, at a blank value. Um, and then from there, we can start to add our loads of constraints. So what I'm envisioning is for our hypothetical hypothetical case here is that we put this inside some oven so we just want to see some free thermal expansion but I do need to keep the model statically stable so I'm going to select the bottom surface and looking at the mini axis or reference in the mini axis we'll apply a TY constraint there so I'm just going to go to constraints we'll set them all free I'll click the T excuse me TY select that bottom surface uh, and then I'll, I'll label it here just so I know what it is. We'll say TY constraint, say OK. And I can see that in the menu tree or the model tree, and I can see that constraint is on the model. So that keeps the object from you know, moving through space. And that means when we apply some elevated temperature from the stress-free, I expect the growth to occur upward. So I should have all positive Y uh, expansion values. And then um, you know, I can select one of the side surfaces here and we'll apply a TZ constraint. So let's go ahead and say constraints and I'm gonna do free and I'm gonna do TZ and we'll select that face and I'll say okay. So that means that all the thermal growth is gonna take place uh, you know, moving away from that particular surface. If I wanted to be super, um, uh, what do I wanna say? Um, 
maybe diligent about the way that I'm doing this. Maybe what I would do is, you know, I could split the entire model in half and get a split line and inventor, and then select that line that goes right through the center of the geometry and apply that TZ constraint that way. That way, half of this model would expand in the one direction, half the model would expand in the opposite direction. I get that. Um, I'm just trying to to illustrate how we can do one setup of, of free thermal expansion. So I'm just applying basic, you know, TX, TY, TZ constraints somewhere in the model. Obviously, uh, if this is your own geometry that you're working with, um, you know, if this um, bore were welded to, um, you know, some other uh, object and you wanted to constrain the model there, then by all means, go ahead and apply your constraints there. But uh, again, I'm just adding some minimum constraints. Um, so that we can get the model to expand and not have you know crazy high stresses because we completely fixed the surface. So on the back surface here, this is the one that I'm missing. I forgot to label this other constraint. So let's go ahead and give that an appropriate label. So that would be my TZ constraint. And then on the back surface is where we will apply our TX. So I'm gonna do a constraint, select that surface, choose free. And there we go. So there's my TX constraint. So the constraints aren't really the focus of this, this illustration anyway. What we wanted to show was within the linear static stress, presuming again that our part or our assembly is all at some elevated or reduced temperature, how do we apply that stress-free reference temperature and how do we apply the uh, what will be the applied temperature, the elevated or reduced temperature. So let's start with the stress-free reference temperature. Uh, where are we going to do that? We're going to go ahead and select loads. And then from loads, um, what we can do is go to the type drop-down menu. And in the type drop-down menu, there we can say that we want to have a body temperature. And that is where we put the, again, the elevated or the reduced temperature. So I'm going to say that my part is put into an oven. And eventually, it's all going to reach... 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So the point of my analysis would just be to see how much it expands going from a stress-free reference temperature to this 400 degrees um, and what are my stresses as a result of that. So I'm going to give this a name. We'll say it's the applied temp load. We'll say okay. And I'm not selecting any, any of the bodies in the geometry. I'm just saying all of the uh, components, I only have a single component, but all the components are going to be at that same temperature. Uh, and then we need to assign the, the stress-free temperature. Not that you have to do these in this precise order. You could do the stress-free and then the applied or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. Let's again go back to loads. And we're going to change again the type. We're going to go from force to an initial condition. And this is where we can define what our stress-free reference temperature is. So uh, I'm going to imagine that this is manufactured, machined uh, in some environment where it was 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So that'll be my stress-free reference temperature. Right? And I should probably name that one too. Let me go ahead and edit that load. And I'm going to call that ref temp. There we go. All right. So there, my 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's my reference temperature, and then my applied of 400, so that way I have a delta T of, of 330 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the minimum amount of information that I need to assign in order to run this thermal expansion analysis. Of course, if I have other structural loads, if I have pressure maybe inside that hole or I have a force on this face, you could certainly add the structural loads into it. I'm just trying to keep it kind of simple here so we can focus on the thermal end of it. Um, let's go ahead and continue on with our setup. I do need to generate the mesh. Uh, we can go in the mesh settings and set our element size if we want. I'm just going to run with the defaults. Should be sufficient for this model. I'm not a huge fan of that mesh color, so I'm going to change that. Let me edit that idealization. We'll change the color of our mesh. There we go. Not that that matters other than for what we'd like to look at. Uh, and at that point, I think I am ready to run this analysis. So let's go ahead and run it. And very quickly here, we should have some results. 
And again, keep in mind that this is for when the entire part or assembly is going to be at some particular temperature. We'll do a separate video uh, for the instance or the case when you have a gradient. So here we are in the results. Um, you can see that we have nice low stresses because we just allowed it to have free thermal expansion. So again, if I go to a maybe this back view here, we fix this bottom face. So you can see this little dashed red line is the um, original position of the geometry. So we can exceed, see that it all expanded upward in the y direction. And then we fix this face uh, in Z, so we can see our expansion away from that face. There's the original edge. Um, and then if we go out this way, we'd have to look at the side view here. I fix this back face in X. So of course my expansion uh, in this case is going in the minus X direction there. You can see the, the dashed red line where the original display was. And of course, uh, we do exaggerate the displacements. These are not the actual displaced uh, shape, if you will. I can show you how to do that in a moment. Um, but let's take a look at, um, well, why don't we go ahead and do that first? Uh, if I want, I can right click here and we say edit. And if I want to go to a true display shape, then I can go to deform options. And instead of percent, we would put it on actual. And now if I put it on actual of one, so that's one times the, the displacements. So again, uh, we could do that, but with a thermo expansion model, usually the expansion is so small, uh, we, you know, it would be hard to visually look at the model and, and see what that expansion is. I do like that because that way if I'm doing a report, uh, for instance, and I snap some images, you know, I could say, well, let's make it 10 times and click on display. Uh, so that way, when I create my images for somebody, I could say, well, the displacements that you're looking at are 10 times or 20 times, uh, whatever the case might, might be the actual uh, displacement. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of those displacements from the pull down menu here. We're going to take a look at displacement. And there's our total displacement. And the total displacement is a square root, some of the squares computation of the X component, Y component, and Z component. So it kind of makes sense um, that our max is at the furthest away from, remember the bottom surface, this side surface, and the back surface are all constrained. So the point furthest away, uh, once we you know, do the square sum and the square root of the square root some of the squares of all those components, the point furthest from all those constraints is, is what's seeing max. But we can validate this in a way, right? We took that measurement that was um, five inches tall. So let's take a look at, for instance, the y-axis displacement. And there's my value. And I'm just going to jot that down. So it's 0 0.011. Uh, and let's go back. I'm going to say return to get me out of the results environment. And let's go back and take a look at those material properties, right? So there's my thermal coefficient of expansion. So let's go ahead with our calculator and we'll say 0.0. That's one, two, three, four, five. And then six as I have four of those, one, two, three, four, and then a seven. So that's my thermal coefficient of expansion. And I'm going to multiply that by the delta T. Remember, over here, we applied a load of 400, and we said the stress-free was 70. So that gives me a uh, delta T of 330. So let's multiply my thermal coefficient of expansion by 330. And then we multiply by that length, which was 5 inches. And there we go. So there's the 0 0.011 which corresponds with the value that we saw in the results environment. So that gives us some indication, uh, some confidence in, in the values that we obtained there. So let's go ahead and we'll say okay to this. Now the alternate method, as opposed to doing this, this temperature here that we did, this uh, initial condition, uh, would be to define it inside the uh, material property. So let me go ahead and remove this load, that reference temperature. I do want to keep the applied load at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and I'm going to go back into the material properties here and there we can define the reference temperature just as well there so let's go ahead and define that 70 degrees Fahrenheit it thinks that my mesh is out of date probably because I was in that material screen so let's generate the mesh again and let's go ahead and solve my geometry again and we should get the same 0 0.011 for our y direction again there's our total displacement let's check our y direction and there's our 0 0.011 so that does match uh, what we calculated before okay so it's kind of important uh, just remember that you can define the stress free reference temperature in one of two ways again you can either go to loads and under loads you can assign the initial condition or alternative to that uh, when you go into the material you also have a t ref right there that you can utilize all right so hopefully that's helpful thanks for watching have a great day